was a single hive. Uh, I was trying to clean up, clean up and make it a little more presentable for Larry, the cameraman. And this hive was showing all signs of, of swarming, which was a real surprise to me because this hive had struggled, it did not impress me this spring with his vigor. And I just kind of crossed my fingers and left it alone. But when I came out here yesterday, it was sitting here with two deeps and a, and a shallow uh, honey super. It was full, top to bottom. The outsides of the hive was covered with bees. I could not believe it. And I had to do something. I thought about waiting for today when Larry came out with the film to show you the split, but it couldn't wait. Uh, I had the hive bodies here. I, uh, I took it apart. I set the honey back, and then the next box aside, I had a, a, a box with frames and, and honey comb, in, but empty comb, that I set on the bottom, this one. I took the body, the body that was here and set it up here. Most probably the queen was in this lower one, and I wanted, I, I hope so. By putting her over here, she'll draw a lot of her, her bees, everything that was in the box. And uh, then I put another empty box here. And the other, this one was the original box here. With that queen gone, this batch will, will raise a new queen from young cells. There might have even been a queen cell in there. I didn't take it apart to look. It's, it's just kind of called a, a walk away split. At least, uh, least labor usually works. There, there's so many bees, there's enough for both hives. The reason why I took the one of the queen over here, I wanted this hive that's, that's building a new, or grooming and, and raising a new queen to have the majority of the workforce coming back. They're really ingrained to this exact spot to come back. Most of the adult foragers will come back to here. As the bees that were in the, the brood comb here hatch, they will be imprinted to that site, and then this uh, hive will build up fast again too. But the, the honey super was full. I, I pulled a, just one frame out of there because I needed some for my table and for some friends. Uh, wonderful uh, spring honey just a touch of uh, fruit trees to it. And, and of course, it's been a nice clover flow for five, six weeks now. So there's good clover notes to it. And actually here is the jar of honey from that frame yesterday. Nice uh, amber. It, it seems runny almost, but the sugar content is high when when a pint weighs a pound and a half versus a pound for water, you know the, the sugar content is there. It's less than 18% uh, moisture and it'll be good, stable, keeping honey. Welcome back to uh, my little homestead, Hermitage Homestead, the apiary, the, and now the, uh, what we term the, the Garden of Beden. Larry's films have been popular, had some nice uh, feedback from people saying, I can't have beehives, uh, either from uh, zoning, or, zoning uh, regulations or uh, maybe some physical limitations, or some people are, are just quite considerate of their neighbors. They maybe have a, a child or a child, someone in the neighborhood who's allergic to bees and they will not risk having a hive around. And that's you know, just the right thing to do. No need to take that chance. But what they can do, is uh, plant a few plants for the pollinators, not just the honeybees, the, the bumblebees, the native bees, the moths, the butterflies, the, even the bats need some, some nectar from the flowers. So uh, what we're wanting to do here is, is give people some means to select some plants and see them in location growing. Strawberries are not just good for us, they bloom, this is a June bearer. They just have that kind of a June crop. You, there are ever bearers, but they're just harder to keep going. And the, the downside of having berries all the time is that you build up some of the diseases and the insects that also eat on. So I like having a June berry. You get a big crop. 
it's done, and then uh, you get into this suckering process. This was only 25 plants, and it's already increased to six or seven times that. And I carefully placed the runners in that uh, check planting method. So you got a row across this way, a row at 60 that way, a row at 60 that way. And it gives you, a, if you can see it, a hexagon pattern, which is the uh, cell shape of, in the honeycomb. So it's just a natural to me. Here's a couple beds that are just more ornamental than anything, but also bee plants. I, uh, with my animal background, I have to have plants with animal names to them. This one's called lamb's ear. And if you've ever held a, a newborn lamb after the years are dried off, of course, this feels so much like a, a lamb's ear. It's, it's the best imitation there, there is. Stakies is the, the Latin. Here's some, I've just sprinkled some Cosmos seeds. Uh, that'll be a, a, an excellent uh, bee plant later. This is a, a popular house plant and, and people love, although not so common, people have had a, a rage for purple. And the undersides of this leaf is a nice purple. This is uh, Trade Scantia. It's sort of a, a miniature Moses in the boat, but it doesn't get those little flower bracts in the white flowers like Moses in a boat does. But it uh, sends out babies kind of like hen and chicks and uh, kind of makes an interesting plant. It won't survive the winter. I'll either have to pot it up and take it in, or if, if someone wants some, they're welcome to to come in out and adopt them. This is a, a sedum variety called Dragon's Blood. And it does get kind of a, a burgundy to its foliage too. And I did see, I thought, first first flower stalk, it'll bloom kind of rose, rose pink. And the bees will like that. Over here is hen and chicks. That one looks more hen and chick-like. This one kind of crowing like a rooster and gonna bloom. Another one over there has little chicks around it. But uh, just odd how, I wonder how that plant decides whether it's gonna be a flowering one or, or if it's going to reproduce asexually like the little chicks around its base. This is going to be an entire sedum bed. And then, of course, the taxonomists and, and new DNA testing realize this one we used to call sedum spectabili is not really a sedum. It's now, instead of one little compact five-letter word, it's a six-syllable word. Hylotelephium, I believe, is the name. I've, I've been trying to commit that to memory with mixed success. But it blooms August, September, and it gets the full range of bees, butterflies, moths, you name it. It's, it's a circus around there. It used to be more involved before we started to use so much of this clothianidin on the corn. Um, and that's, last year I made the mistake of not having corn in my garden. And my bees ranged out to industrial ag corn, brought home that uh, toxic pollen and, and I lost 70% of my hives. So, that was an expensive lesson, which I won't do again. I, I'm a little bit buffered here with game and parks land surrounding me and the town over here not having much corn, but there is a tiny little ag plot just 200 yards that way that was corn last year and made my mistake. So I, the reason for the whole garden and the corn specifically is, is to let my bees get as much things close to home as they can. We've got a local vor movement for people, but I also try to apply it to the bees too. Corn doesn't need bees for pollination. It does just fine with the wind. Um, before I move to that corn, here's, here's another little orphan sedum uh, from my sister's neighbor. I, think, I believe it's called sedum acre. I had that in the house, multiplying it, nursing it back to health. I, I salvaged it from a throwaway pile. It filled about a seven inch pot over the winter. Brought it out here and about a month ago, it looked like this hedgehog. <laughs> and then now it has yellow blossoms on it. 
yellow is popular with the bees. There's another little sedum back there that blooms yellow. That, it's, well, it's already starting there. If I get that sweet clover out of the way. Here's an experiment. <laughs> I transplanted a sweet clover seedling just to see how much they would tolerate it. They do just fine. It's, it's going to be a, it makes a big vegetated plant this year. The yellow version is biennial. It'll do its blooming, start around the week of Memorial weekend and bloom for a month. That white one is more an annual, but you got to have that in the ground and germinated before April, kind of early in April, or it won't bloom. This lush little patch here is Impatience balsami. You, you recognize the Impatience name, the, the Impatience that's so popular in the garden now is of course in the same genus. And it gained favor and kind of crowded this one out because our, the Wallariana has its flowers up on top for us to see. This balsami has them hidden down here along the stalk so it's not so obvious for us, but the bees kind of like that shade and shelter and privacy. So it's a good bee plant. Uh, I, I tried to plant it too early and the, the seed really needed more warmth. And then I, I misread the seed package. I thought it said full sun. And I, sh I should have known impatience like some shade. So I got kind of lucky just by my placement of putting this corn patch here it gets shade from that hottest midday sun and a serendipity or mother nature looked after me and, and saved me. Now, why do, the, why do the bees go to get to corn pollen when the corn doesn't need it? Well, look how big this pollen grain is. There's three of them there. They're, they're the size of a of a fennel seed if you're a, a chef. It's, it's cheap, it's easy protein. The bees take it back to the nest and it, it piles up fast, but they don't, the bees don't know that it also has the systemic insecticides in it and it's lethal. That's why I planted my patch of popcorn, my patch of sweet corn. Why are these up ahead? <laughs> I had some seed from last year of a, of a sweetness enhanced. Germination was lousy, I should have just pulled the five that germinated, but I put a, a later kind of regular variety underneath it. So there's some sweet corn here, another succession back there, and a third one back there. Um, back to, oh, right here is for both of us. This is southern okra. It uh, really likes the hot weather, but I see it's starting to gather up some some buds here. I would like to be Uncle Sam in the suit saying, I want you to garden for the bees if you can't have the bees yourself. If you can't garden for the bees, be an activist. Uh, write or call the EPA or your senator and say, why are we putting these, uh, approving these chemicals that are toxic, not just to bees, but as Hank Tenneke says in, in the Netherlands, a tech toxicologist, they're destroying the whole web of life. We can't continue this way.